If you're a working creative director at 45, you've got a timestamp on your head that's months away. Hey, if I'm getting sunsetted out of my graphic design career at 50, I've got 20 more years of working life in me. How am I going to manage that? This is Philip Van Dusen. He has decades of experience in branding and creative, working with brands like Doritos, Cheetos and Sun Chips, Kraft, PetSmart, National Geographic, Microsoft, and so many more. That was a really, really rude awakening at an advanced age. How old were you when, you when you left after 25 years? I'm not going to. You don't ask people their age, Mark. <laughs> I'm I gray. ask people all I'm, the time and they always not, answer. You're you can like just look at me. I'm gray. And so I try to prepare people to not do what I do. That eventually one day you will be on your own. You're a creative entrepreneur and where I'd like to kick off, because I think that each of us kind of considers entrepreneurship differently, creativity differently. What does it mean to you to be a creative entrepreneur? Well, in the entrepreneurial idea, it's owning your own brand. I mean, for me, it was, you know, I, I worked 25 plus years on big corporate as a creative leader, big agency as a creative leader. Like you and say big corporate, but like really big corporate. Like yeah. we're talking like PepsiCo and big, Old Navy. huge agencies yeah. and like, like you're living global agencies, you're yeah. living like the modern version of Mad Men, right? Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, but I've, I, and working with the, you know, the fortune 500, 100, right? So big clients, big agencies, giant teams, things like that. And when I came out of the tail end of that, I realized that I'd spent my entire career building other people's brands. And I had spent very little time building my own. So much so that essentially what I had was a three-page black and white website built on Wix and a, you know, a 50-page PDF portfolio slideshow. And that's what I had to show for my own personal brand. And you know, I had a LinkedIn profile that was admirable, right? A lot of big titles, a lot of big companies. Um, but now I was on my own and I was starting my own consultancy and I didn't have a, you know, a stick of apart from my LinkedIn profile and my old business cards, credibility credentials to show for it. Um, didn't have a website, didn't have social media profiles, had developed no content, never written a blog, not a newsletter, not a video, not a podcast, not a nothing. And I realized that I really had to, I had to build the Philip Van Dusen brand from scratch. And uh, that was a really, really rude awakening at you know, at an advanced age when I decided to walk away from <laughs> how, big, how old were you when, you when you left after 25 years? I'm not going to, you don't ask people their age, Mark. <laughs> I'm I gray. ask people all I'm, the time and they always not, answer. You're you can like just the first look at me. I'm gray. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm up there. I'll put it that way. Do you, okay. Do, do you think, especially within creative, but corporate creative entrepreneurship, content producer. Do you think there's ageism tied to that? Because I'm going to be Massive. honest with you. I ask people their age and they go, oh, I'm 63 or, oh, yeah. I'm 52. How did you guess that? I am 63. Oh, are you? Yes. I didn't even know that. I'm 63. Pick the number. Yeah. And, uh, but you're right. And that's a whole episode in itself. I mean, pot, uh, the creative profession is rife with ageism. Um, and I've actually done videos on that and there's been studies done on that in terms of, you know, AIGA came out with a huge study on the status of creative professionals in the United States anyway. And, you know, when you look at the bar graphs in that study, it's heartbreaking that, you know, that the people working in the industry professionally falls off a cliff at 50. I mean, it's just, it's really, really shocking. Um, is that because they burn out and I've seen people hit 50 and go, no, it's because they the get energy. I can't reinvent myself or are they nope. pushed out? Nope. They're pushed out. Really? Yeah, absolutely. And I know because I did it to people. And I also know because I know a lot of headhunters and I've also moved from company to company at an advanced stage and seen it in action. Um, the, you know, the numbers say it, the headhunters say it, the layoffs and sunsetting says it. Um, when you talk to senior level people who've been in the industry a long time, 
when, you know, if you, if you're in advertising, which is probably the worst in terms of ageism, when you, if you're a working creative director at 45, you've got a timestamp on your head that's months away. I mean, it is, it's very, very difficult to, unless you're a principal in an agency and you own your own agency, um, they're always looking for, they equate young with bright ideas and very, very little, um, very little weight is put on levels of experience. And that's a shame because there's a lot of really super talented people out there who have been sunsetted out of agency and corporate careers who still have a lot to offer, but they go out on their own and they leverage their, you know, wealth of experience as I'm doing for, um, for my clients and for my, my audience. You've touched on something that I've not really thought about, but it always worried me as I entered my 30s, owning a creative agency myself that I was going to age out. And that's mm-hmm. the term I kind of thought of like, like I, I wouldn't know. And, and I've watched myself do it. You know, I've got teenage kids who, who are trying to fill me in on what happens on social media and what works and doesn't work. And so I, I watch it happening in real time. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're working in a corporate job, there's this sense or this promise or this structure or somehow you've been led to believe that like you are going to progress and you're going to progress and you're going to progress and, and it's going to mean something, but you're, you're investing all your time and energy and your, your love and your passion and your, your hardest working hours into something where at 45, they're going to push you out. That's you spent all of these years building something else for someone else only to be left with nothing at a really critical time when you're supposed to be at your highest earning potential. Mm. Uh, that's that's got to scare people if if you're listening to this and you're and you're in corporate working to build that career only to not see that five or ten or fifteen years from now you're just going to be pushed out with nothing. Yeah, and that's one of those things that I do in my business and in with my community that I try to impress upon people is that and a lot of creatives really have no idea that this is in their future. They think I'm going to work as a graphic designer. I'm going to work my way up to creative director. I'm going to, you know, become an ECD or VP of design at some company, you know, and I'll get my golden watch at 65 and everything will be great. And they get to 40 and for some reason they get laid off or 45, they get laid off of their agency job or their corporate job and some restructuring or something like that. And they start looking for employment. And they realize that they're not getting calls. They're not getting interviews. And they are, they are realizing that it's a lot harder to find that next job at that age. And some people give up by the time they're 50, trying to find a new gig in the creative industries. And they end up freelancing or consulting or going out on their own. And you can see that in, you know, um, quantifiable metrics in this AIGA study. And it's repeated itself year after year for like the last three years that after the age of 50, the number of working designers in the industry goes down to like 5%. I mean, it's crazy. And so I try to prepare people to not do what I did, which is not focus entirely on your job, your title, building brands for other people and, and ignore the fact that eventually in, in one day, you will be on your own. And you will be 55. You will be, and you'll, you know, and we're working till 65, 70, you know, even longer at these times. So, I mean, you got to think, hey, if I'm getting sunsetted out of my graphic design career at 50, I've got 20 more years of working life in me, you know, for to expect. How am I going to manage that? And you do not want to fall into that like I did, which is with a three page black and white website and a PDF portfolio and no presence or network that is going to support you in a new endeavor. And so I try to prepare people for that idea of building your personal brand as you are employed and anticipating as a creative professional that you will be sunsetted out of your career earlier than many. Mm, Yeah. Do you think... I often wonder if creatives more so than other people wait to be given something, you know, like, hmm. like I, I started, um, I went to film school and when I graduated, I went to television and I kind of felt like if I did a good enough job, 
people would recognize it and like give me the opportunity. And if I worked hard enough, then I would be given the raise. And it's almost like, you know, you you pitch the client and you have to be given, you know, in our in our industry, you pitch the client and you have to be given the opportunity to win the business. And it and and maybe because I'm in this industry, it feels more personal than others. Maybe in manufacturing or other places, it's the same thing. But I don't know. I feel like I feel like creatives work on their craft and stuff and then kind of hope that they're going to be given stuff as opposed to in other industries where you just maybe go out and make it happen for yourself. Do you, do you think that might be the case? That's a really interesting question. And I've, I've managed creative teams my entire career. I mean, I've managed teams as small as three, as large as 65 across multiple divisions. I find creative professionals for the most part, there are some people who just like designing. They just like working on their craft, creating beautiful things and, you know, going out and having great vacations and listening to music and, you know, living their life. There are other creatives who are slightly more ambitious than that, who are looking to advance. They want to learn more about marketing, about business, about managing people. They want to have a little more agency in terms of their career. They may um, want to, you know, advance into levels of management. And um, because in order to improve your salary, you have to. I mean, there is, that's another thing I, I try to counsel graphic designers on is that there's also a, a there's a mid career, there's a serious glass ceiling in the creative industries. You can start off as a junior, become a graphic designer, then you become a senior, then become a, a, a associate creative director. But where you start managing people is this ceiling. And there are people who, don't want to manage people. They don't want to, um, the responsibility of project management. They just want to design and God bless those people, except they have to realize that you're going to reach a title level and a salary level. That's going to cap out. You're going to meet a specific salary level, depending on the agency company you're in, and it's going to stop. And you're not going to be promoted beyond that because there are what they call salary bands, you know, where you have to fit into a particular salary range with a particular title. And in order to, you know, make the bigger bucks, get the stock options, you know, things like that, you have to start managing people. You have to start learning about business, managing budgets, um, dealing with HR and hiring and things like that. And, and that takes you away from designing. And the higher up you move, the farther away you get from designing. And so lots of graphic designers have no idea that there's this stopping point that they have to, it's an inflection point where they have to make a decision. Am I willing to give up doing designing so much in order to make more money and get a bigger title? Or am I going to be happy where I am, what I'm making? Because lots of them think, oh, you know, creative directors are great because they just tell people what to do, right? They just get to <laughs> point and say what's good and not and design, oh, yeah. right? And then I make three times as much more money. But they don't understand. I mean, one of my po most popular videos on YouTube is what does a creative director actually do, right? right? And it's, uh, it's, it's an eye opener for a lot of people. A lot of people have no idea what a creative director does. And so... In, in terms, terms of, of salary terms of managing the team and yeah and and strategy and helping to win the pitch and yeah oh yeah the creative concepts and like all of client just, relationships like, the right. buck stops here i mean i got the comment i got a comment on that video the other day that said something like being a creative director is like you get none of the accolades and all of the problems so if you if your work and your team's work does really well you congratulate your team it's not you and if the work sucks and the client hates it, they're coming to you. Yeah. Right? I think anyone who's an entrepreneur goes, Hey, that's just like being a business owner. <laughs> yeah. So, Hey, yeah. If you want to become a creative entrepreneur, become a creative director and you'll start to feel what it feels like. <laughs> but on the other hand, I mean, I've been a creative leader my whole life. I started off as a painter. I have my master's in painting. I didn't actually get into graphic design until I was 32 years old. 
I actually was pursuing a career as a, a fine artist, as a teacher in university and found out that that was like a serious dead end. And so I started my own t-shirt company, putting my artwork on t-shirts and starting to sell it. And that's how I fell into the kind of the, the apparel industry. But as I moved up through the apparel industry and started to manage people, I realized that being a creative director, or a creative leader was a lot like teaching. I mean, I was leading people, I was inspiring them, I was giving them creative direction, I was helping them learn, helping them navigate their careers. It was just like teaching, except I got paid a hell of a lot more money <laughs> and I wasn't out of work every nine months. And you didn't have to keep up with the uh, the never ending, I mean, maybe people in fashion like this, but just, um, I was learning all about Pantones um, because I didn't, like, I, I mean, I know about Pantone colors and for those who are listening who don't know, it's like the official, it's the official color codes, but that Pantone would put out these lookbooks like a year in advance or two years in advance oh, yeah. to try and, to try and sh help um, fashion houses forecast, you know, which shade of lavender is going to be the shade. And it was interesting to, to learn whether, you know, these color forecasts um, that come out a year and a half advance so that way people in fashion can buy material so that way they can actually design so they can actually make so they can actually ship so it can actually hit the shelves whether pantone is forecasting the colors or they're just dictating it but they're but dictating the thought... it <laughs> no i can tell you that so the council I mean, that gets part together of, part in of my job is... for 10 years was to travel the world and, and gather trend which is yeah. why my trend videos are the most popular videos i have is because i have a lot i i was a trend person i ran the trend department at old navy and so I can tell you exactly how it works. And haven't you always found it interesting that when, when you, the new season comes out, right. And you go to a bunch of clothing stores yeah, it's like, it's that coral. everyone is on board with the same thing, right? Ruching sleeves are in for women. And then it's like, you go to this other store and ruching sleeves are there and it's all in, you know, mauve or periwinkle. And then suddenly go over this other store and they they have bathing suits and bathing suits have ruching on them and they're periwinkle, right? And you're like, how did these people all come out with the same style, same color palette, the same material, right? Independently. Well, the answer is they didn't. The answer is they went to the color conferences and the Pantone conferences and they were told what is going to be the palette in a year and a half. And they, um, and they were, and then there are other fast fashion companies that that dictate, you know, a lot of what the styles are going to be. So, yeah. it's um, it's an industry, you know, trend is an industry. It's not like it happens by accident. I remember the first time that I uh, that I was working on a, a television broadcast commercial, and it was it was an in-house produced commercial, so def very different in the agency world, but not that different. We sat around a table, and a whole bunch of us came up with ideas. And I pitched an idea that everyone seemed to like. I was only 22 years old, zero experience. Everyone liked it. And they said, oh, we're making that one. And I thought, all right, like, like I'm not, I'm not, the, not only am I not the smartest guy here, I literally just came up with an idea. There's no research. There's no, like, and then they used all this confirmation bias later to like help explain why this would be a great commercial. But it scared the shit out of me to go like, is this all business is, is like just whatever we kind of like is what it becomes like without any more substance to it. And so I have to imagine walking into these, you know, walking into these trend uh, conferences, it, it, it either revealed more about how the world really works, whether that's good or bad, or it may have taken some of the like majesty out of how we think <laughs> creative well, comes to be. Yeah. And I mean, some people, for instance, when it comes to developing the peril styles, right? So the cut and the sort of details that are on things. You have to realize that a lot of these companies actually work with the same manufacturers in China and India, you know, the, these massive, massive apparel manufacturers, and they go on development trips. They sketch up a bunch of stuff and they take it to China to get it sampled. Well, the factory that they're in, Old Navy's there, Abercrombie and Fitch is there. Uh, the guys from Ralph Lauren are there guys from um, Prada are there and all of these designers are all getting their stuff sampled in the same factories and they're seeing each other's stuff. They're seeing each other's materials, what each other are doing. So this is a year out. This is a year before these things actually hit the shelf. They're working in spring 2022 for spring 2023. 
and they are, they, they, they nick ideas from each other and they, you know, sample a variation of this other thing that this other company is sampling. And that's where all of that kind of, um, kind of stew becomes, you know, all of the disparate, disparate ideas that do come up through designers. That's how they propagate themselves across a whole range of companies. And that's how, that's where and how they actually become trend. And did that demystify things for you or like, or did you find it like the most curious thing ever? Uh, I'm fascinated by trend because it, and a lot of people also have, and I think that trend is the new original idea. Trend is not an original idea. What a trend is, by definition, is a movement in design or any kind of um, you know creation of a thing that has gained enough momentum and enough usage that it can be recognized as something that is massing, something that is starting to happen. Mm-hmm. And so... It's not the single original idea. It is the single original idea that became adopted by enough people and produced across enough platforms that it can be actually recognized as something that is starting to trend. So that's the misconception a lot of people have about trend. In order to recognize trend, you just have to know how to observe it and then document it to show to people, which is what I do in my trend videos. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is okay. So this is super cool. I'm I was reading a few months ago Jonah Berger's book. He's he's the author of Contagious and and, and a few other books. But I was reading his his book on influence, and he was talking about the fact that you know it, it's it's very very hard for us to be able to predict what's going to hit and what's not going to hit. Otherwise, you know, J.K. Rowling wouldn't you know Rowling wouldn't have been passed over so many times before you know she got the book deal and um and and you can point to case after case after case. I am not uh, an early adopter and I don't really consider myself trendy and I don't I'm not sure if I'm even good at spotting trends because I just I just don't I just don't know what's going to land not land what's good what's not good so I kind of just wait see what everyone else is doing and then you know and I, I wish I could become more uh, better at this more trendy so like you mentioned it's how you look at things it's how to spot them it's what you do with them um, and and for anyone listening, you know, you can go over to to Philip's website, and we'll share the link below. and And he has a, a free download in terms of you know hundred killer resources that that are are trending right now, volume two. So how do you know that you're good at this? <laughs> That's because because you could just pick anything, couldn't you? And then be like, ah, oh, I got sixty percent, right? Like, is it just is yeah. it just based on taste? Is it based on like like what are you looking at? You look at threads for instance when you're shopping when you're shopping for trend you may go to a number of different stores and you may see a particular design aesthetic or a certain style of illustration or a certain material and you may start to and if you go to enough stores or enough places you may you you just pay attention to what you're seeing and then your mind will start to create connection threads between the different places where you're seeing it. You may say, oh, that's a really cool design. It's yellow. It's, you know, kind of a splashy illustration of a bee, right? And then you go to another store and you see a lot of yellow and you see a lot of splashy illustrations, but they're not bees, right? Then you go to a different store and you see a lot of bees, but they're not yellow and they're not splashy illustrations. You start to pull these threads together and, and start to see things appear in multiple places. And if you see them enough, you realize that that is something that is beginning to trend. And, it, and to a certain extent, it's a learned eye, you know, yeah. you have to, you have to do it enough and, and really be incredibly observant and, and register and kind of save things in your head that you're seeing in order to pull those things threads together. I mean, one of the things we used to do when I, I ran the t-shirt department at Old Navy, which was a $700 million a year business. I mean, think about it. And in just graphic t-shirts. And we, you know, we would go around the world, Tokyo, Paris, Berlin, Milan, London, and we would shop dozens and dozens of stores and we would buy samples of other shirts. We would also shop bookstores and, and, you know, product stores and, 
we would look for things that we found inspiring, looked fairly new, but also um, were um, exciting or, you know, kind of um, motivating to us that might generate design ideas. And we would buy hundreds and hundreds of samples and things, and we would bring them all back to New York City. And we'd lay them all out in a giant room. And then you start to piece together things that had similar themes or similar colors or similar illustrations. And the, the, I, the, what you saw as these threads would start to congeal and come together. And that's exactly what I do when I develop my trend videos and my trend um, projections. They're not really projections. They're more like reports because you're reporting what is already happening. You're not telling people what will happen in the future. You're just reporting what you're seeing, but you're pulling together like items, like ideas into collections that when viewed as a whole are a point of view. Right. That is amazing. That is, that is, that is so cool. The, my, the thought going through my head is, and this may be a muscle that you train over time, but you have to, you have to make a, a statement, right? So you're going to lay everything out or you're going to look at these elements. Or you're going to start to pull things together. You're going to start to see this trend in your head, this pattern that's emerging. At a certain point, you have to have confidence in, in, in making the call or yes. confidence in your ability to say like, this is what we're going to do. This is what I see happening. Is, is that something that we can get better at? Or is that based on courage? Or is that based on experience? Or how, how like, ignore yeah. the $700 million t-shirt business just in, in, in starting your own company or, or whatever it is you're doing at a certain point. What, and what I love to see, what brings tears to my eyes as I'm watching people on stage is the commitment or the courage to say like, this is what I'm doing. Is there a question in there? Mark, I, yeah. As you're developing, <laughs> no. Yeah, as you're developing the trend at a certain yeah, point, you have to yeah, say yeah. like, "This is this is what I'm going to do." Oh and yeah, how absolutely. How do you come to trust your gut? I, you know, I guess that it's the years of experience I've personally had doing it. But I mean, what I do is I I I look at a ton of stuff and I collect imagery when I find something inspiring or start to see a threat emerge. For instance, you know, just take an example. There were, there's a lot of, you know, kind of geometric kind of building block like shapes that are being used in layout. And so I would see one in an email I got from the New York Times. And then I would see one on an illustration that was on Communication Arts Magazine. And then I would see one that was on a t-shirt design that I saw pop up on some apparel website. And I would grab those JPEGs and I just throw them into a folder, right? First of all, I show throw them all into one folder. And then as I start to look through them, I'm like, oh, wow, that geometric thing is kind of like this geometric thing. And this color palette is kind of like this color palette. And I'll create a folder and say, you know, geo shapes and I'll put all those in there. And then I'm now my antenna are up to look for that. So then as I'm going about my day and looking through more creative, I'm like, oh, that totally fits in with that geo thing. And I'll pull that JPEG out. Right. And I do this across 20 or 30 different concepts or ideas that I start to see emerge. And then at the end of the year, when it's time for me to put out my video, I look through those folders and I go, okay, this folder's got like 80 things in it. This one folder has like three say, so the three folder is obviously they were outliers, but the one with 80 in it, that's the one that obviously there's a lot of stuff going on in this concept, this idea, and that one will make it into the video. So there is a discerning, you know, kind of a decision-making kind of um, apex that I have to cross when it comes time to pull the trigger and say, okay, this is going to be a slide of one of the 14 trends that I'm going to put out there. That is so cool. That is so cool. And I, I've just, I'm thinking of all the ways we could apply that type of process, whether it's, um, you know, idea generation for even just a new business or operation Absolutely. or what have you. Like this isn't just, this isn't just for design, but, no. but um, it's such a, a great way to think about, about trying to spot what's happening. It's absolutely. And that's, that's a really great observation, Mark. And, you know, you could see that happening with, how, you can see it right now with how people are beginning to articulate how to define what Web, web 3.0 is, right? Or how NFTs are actually going to sort out. 
because we've been going through a period of time where it's like the gold rush for NFTs, right? Everyone's, you know, there are people who've made, you know, millions of dollars off NFT collections. And so everyone is rushing to the, to the, the gold rush of NFTs and putting out thousands of little JPEGs of things and some are hitting and some are not. And, but what we're going to, you know, and then crypto crashes and then everyone, and then bathing apes get, pirated and stolen and people realize that the blockchain is not as secure as everyone was saying the blockchain is. And so, and crypto, you know, is, is going down. NFT sales have plummeted, you know, 75% in the last six months, people are starting to wake up and go, Oh, maybe I shouldn't have paid $500 for that unicorn JPEG. Right. Because all I got was a unicorn JPEG and Everyone else has the JPEG. It just, I have a number that says that I actually own it. What is that going to get me? What is, what does this really even mean? And so what happens with the NFT world and how that actually shakes out about what is going to be real and value and have value within that world. And what is going to be a JPEG that has no value. All those things are kind of getting decided right now in human, you know, culture and anthropology, as we go through this process of adopting and bringing something new into the world and figuring out how we're going to use it. And, um, I think I find that absolutely hugely fascinating. I mean, I was having a conversation with Chris Derafib, who runs a company called Flyride, which is a a custom lighting, uh, automotive company. And he's like a genius at social media and is always kind of up on trends and he's been getting deeply into crypto and NFTs. And we're having a conversation on my podcast about it where we were talking about how NFTs are just a JPEG, right? That's you may pay hundreds of thousand dollars for or a couple dollars for, but the value is not in the JPEG. The value is in what comes with it. Is it, how does that manifest itself in real life? Does it manifest itself through events? Does it manifest itself through masterminds or conferences where you get to meet and interact with and network with and do business with other people or have fun with other people, whatever the, uh, you know, kind of the, the zeitgeist of that particular NFT is, but it's the ones that create some sort of physical cultural representation that is linked to the ownership of the NFT that are going to last. And Bathing Ape has done that, right? They've they've had a couple, you know, cruises around Manhattan on yachts. They've had a couple events here and there where they're having manifestations in real life of um, the network and the club that is sur- that surrounds that ownership of that NFT. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this all shakes out. And so um, those are the sorts of things that my antenna are up. And but. I'm not an early, like you, I'm not an early adopter. I'm an early observer. Like I, I watch this stuff really closely and talk to a lot of people about it and see what they're doing and see how it's evolving and where it's going. Um, Because I find that much more fascinating than, you know, jumping into OpenSea and, you know, buying 50 JPEGs and seeing what happens. Right. Um, So I, That's where my trend, I think, um, I comes from is that I, I am a a keen observer and I have a very analytical mind. So I have a tendency to make judgments as I, as I observe things. And so when I see things that are in a state of evolution, like crypto or NFTs or web 3.0, I I find it fascinating to watch them evolve. And, you know, I, I make opinionated pronouncements as they go through, <laughs> <You know? laughs> like I just did here. Uh, so, so it's, I feel like we've touched maybe on three chapters of your life. You know, you mentioned that you were pursuing becoming a fine artist mm-hmm. and, and then you went into, into fashion and design and agency world. And now, you know, you're an entrepreneur, a creative entrepreneur who, who produces content and a podcast and all of these things, but but in in each of those um, career paths or those chapters, certainly the road less traveled. Um, you know, certainly focused on on developing a craft 
or I'm going to use the word art, but I don't mean art as in fine art, but just like developing that craft. And, and um, what I struggle with, and I think a bunch of people struggle with is, again, you have to put yourself into it and put yourself out there and have a perspective and stand for something. And, and all of those things throughout your career, it seems like you've just been very, very comfortable doing this. Is this something that, that you've had to kind of learn and, and, and grow to do more? Or is it something that's always kind of come easily to you? I think that in retrospect, because I have, you know, lived a while and been in the working world a while, I've come to understand what my threads are, what my commonalities are in what I do and what matters to me. And I've always loved design. I've always loved art. I've always loved beautiful imagery and, and, and striking, um, creations. I've also loved learning and I've loved teaching people. Those are the threads that go through my life. And I started off loving creating artwork as a painter. I loved uh, teaching other artists to be able to paint and draw and do photography. I then started to put those creations on shirts and started to fall in love with the idea of making money with my creativity. Um, And then I started managing people, which was that thread of teaching coming back and helping designers progress through their careers, become better designers, figure out how they can make money doing what they love, surviving in a corporate environment or an agency environment and progressing and growing and feeling fulfilled in their lives. And as I moved into consulting, I took a lot of the knowledge that I had around branding and marketing and processes and methodologies that we'd used with the fortune 500 and took those and adjusted those. So now I show small to medium sized businesses, how to use those to advance their businesses and do better marketing and brand themselves better. And in the process, I'm also building a community of creative professionals and teaching them about branding and design and marketing and personal branding and the, how to have a long career, how to, how to, you know, maintain their um, career viability over the long haul. So I'm, and I'm teaching those people how to do that. So again, that teaching thread comes through it and the teaching thread comes through it in working with my clients because I'm teaching about the power of branding and the power of marketing and the power of, uh, you know, competitive analysis and, and brand voices and communication. And so I think as you, as you work through your career, you will find those threads that maintain themselves no matter what it is that you're doing. Um, And that's what, that's what is meaningful to me. You know, it's, it's helping people put beautiful things out into the world and also have fulfilling and comfortable lives. That is so cool. If, if you could go back in time to, you know, a younger version of you to say, Hey, you know, don't worry because no matter what I do and no matter what I attack in, in work in life and career, I'm always going to be able to come back to the thread of, of helping guide people and teach them and consult and help give them. That's really, really cool. I was thinking, you know, of my own career as you were speaking, because I've, I've recently gone through this point of reflection to kind of say, you know, I started my agency in 2006. I was 23 years old. I was really young. What did I do early on to succeed? Um, what, what, were the, what were the things that, I, that year after year after year, even if the, the package looked different, right? The team looked different. The clients looked different. The, what we were giving them or selling them, it always looked different. But there was always this kind of through thread. Um, and, and frankly, for me, it's like, I love, 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 love helping people figure out their problems and what the solution could be. And, and I had a, a staff member years ago tell me like, Mark, at the end of the day, like, like but he, he said it in a way like, all you're doing is problem solving. That was like the thing. It's like, yeah, all, all, I'm, all I'm doing is problem solving. I'm really good at helping people deconstruct this complex thing to say like, I think here are the steps we should take. I wish I could do this for myself better, but, but I, 
I, I almost wonder, you know, we, we think about the future. We think about, you know, starting that career or starting that next thing or pursuing our passion or whatever it is. If we just look back at the things that were always there, we can count on those looking forward, right? You know, you can be 85 or 90, Philip, and you're still gonna, you're still gonna want to just teach people, right? It'll different package, different thing you're selling, what have you, but you can just count. I, I know you can count on teaching people forever now. Yeah. And I think that it's when I, and I say this all the time. So anyone who listens to interviews with me has undoubtedly heard it like 50 times, but I was having a conversation with Paul Pressler, who was the CEO of the gap when we were redesigning banana Republic's logo. And we were having this conversation about careers and he said, Phil, you know, a great career is more like a web than a ladder. And I've always remembered that because a great career is non-linear. And I have found that creative professionals careers are even more non-linear than many. And you, the side jogs, as you're moving up the ladder, you are going to come to a point where you have to make a decision or something's going to be put in your way that makes it necessary for you to take a side, you know, to move laterally rather than vertically. And we look at these things as problems or as failures or as obstacles. When actually, if you are, like you said, Mark, looking for the common thread or a way that you can utilize or leverage what you're great at in that thread, it will take you to a new place and it will make your career stronger because webs are stronger than ladders, right? They, they give and pull in, in many different directions. And I've had a number of very kind of surprising and sometimes painful side jogs in my career that I've had to move laterally. And I haven't really, it hasn't been really clear to me exactly where it's going to lead me, but I've always made that lateral movement with a full understanding of what I was going to learn and how I might be able to apply it to something else. And that's what I think that creatives can really, really benefit from is to understand that they, their career will not be a clearly linear path. And when they are met with a layoff, an obstacle, a, a change in industry, whatever that is, that if they look for a way to express their strength, the thread that of the, the, the manifesto in their life, that's important to them, how they can build and learn in this new direction, then they're going to be okay. And that's, that's probably what I would have told myself if, if I could talk to my 20 year old self that, you know, it's not going to be linear, look for opportunities, take the opportunities and trust that you'll be able to, you know, use what you're good at and what you're passionate about in that new, in that new direction. Are you good at taking that advice? So you would give that to 20 year old you? Yeah. You just, I, I just heard it and I felt it. Do you internalize that as you look forward over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, like all the things that you want to do? Yeah. Um, and, and, and are you able to just own that? Absolutely. And I think that I'm doing it more now than I ever have. In fact, I've been solo for six years now and I've tried more new things and experimented with more new things, sometimes failed with them, sometimes you know, did my best and then decided to sunset it um, more than I ever have. And it's been incredibly exciting and fulfilling because I've been able to learn at every junction and I'm a lifelong learner. I absolutely love it. And in order to progress as an individual, you know, a solopreneur, I've experimented with a ton of stuff, you know, and some stuff has worked and some stuff hasn't. And, but I'm, but I always do things with the understanding of, is this serving my ultimate purpose, this ultimate thread of the things that matter to me, which are helping creative professionals in their careers or helping businesses leverage branding and design so they can succeed in the market and, and have great businesses. Those are like the two major threads that of things that are important to me right now. And then also my own creativity. I mean, I love creating. I love creating podcasts. I love creating videos. I love doing the design work that I do for clients. I love developing intellectual property through brand strategy for my clients. Um, so if I serve those masters of 
of, you know, teaching and helping creative pros, teaching and helping my clients and satisfying my own creative, you know, needs to develop, to produce, then I know that I'm on the right path. And do you feel more energized and younger now? Because I, I, I've recently gone through a health challenge over the last few years and I tell people I'm younger than I used to be. Uh, yeah. and, but also in my, in my career life, um, uh, I'm making honestly less money this year yeah. than I did in, in the past few years. And yet I'm more relaxed. Um, you know, I'm not as stressed out. I don't, my phone buzzes and it doesn't like give me this Freak instant shock. Oh my shock. God. I don't oh get the email yes. from the client saying, Hey, can we talk tomorrow morning? Absolutely. And I suddenly go like, Oh my goodness, what yes. happened? What went wrong? Like, like, I don't have any of that. Are you You're giving me PTSD you right now, Mark, <laughs> man? I'm like totally breaking out in a panic attack. Yeah, no, I am. I'm having more fun than I, I, I tell my wife this all the time. I say, I'm having more, I'm working hard. I'm working a lot of hours, but I'm having more fun in my business and my, and my, and my working life than I ever have in my whole career right now. I'm having a blast. I can't wait to come into the office to work on the thing that I'm working on. And um, I have a tendency to be more of kind of a ambitious workaholic type anyway. And so I've had to actually really push myself to dial back rather than to push forward. I, I, I struggle with actually trying to do less and, you know, kind of sit back and enjoy the fruits rather than wanting to do the next thing or develop the next thing or do the next course or the next mastermind or, you know, and constantly why pushing don't myself. You let yourself constantly push yourself if you're loving it. And like, why don't you just let yourself go? Because I realized, I realized when I burn out from my last corporate job, that balance is critical. And if you let things get too far out of balance, your life will implode. And my life imploded. And this is a great subject for we do hard things because, oh, yeah. you know, my last corporate gig, I was a global vice president of a, you know, Fortune 100 company. And I was working 80 hour weeks and was, had, was losing weight and smoking tons of cigarettes. And it, my life was not, was not good. I wasn't happy. You know, um, I, I had people, you know, sending me emails at three o'clock in the morning from Shanghai expecting, you know, an answer in a half an hour. And I was asleep. And when I woke up, they were pissed at me. And, this, you know, the, the, the phone buzzing thing was it was a palpitation creator, you know. And on top of that, you were talking about health, health things. My dad, um, who has always been very close with my whole life, developed, started to develop dementia and was essentially disappearing from our family, you know, um, slowly. And it was incredibly stress, stressful and distressing to see that happen. And there came a point where I was just like, is this what life is about? Like, is, is this what's really important? Um, and I had to say to myself, no, it's not. I would rather spend 100% of my time in the last three months of my dad's life when he recognizes me than showing up for a global snack meeting, you know, it was like, so I walked away and it was, it was a traumatic, scary decision to make, but ultimately the right one. And I had destroyed my mental health and my physical health to such an extent that it took me almost a year to get better. And I, that was a very, very hard lesson to learn was that, you can't let your life get so out of balance, even if you're pursuing something that you love. And I thought I was pursuing something that I loved. I was also pursuing, pursuing a lot of money because I was making a lot of money. And I, I had to re-examine all of that and say, Hey, you know, life is too short. You know, am I going to wake up wishing that I'd spent, you know, the last three months with my dad or showing up for a, global snacks meeting conference in Shanghai. Right. And I had to make that choice and it was a very, very hard choice to make. And here's the thing. Hey, perfect segue back to the very first part of this conversation, which was ageism, because I knew that if I walked away from this role, it would be the last role that I would be able to have in my career formally with a company or an agency, because I was too old to be hired again in as a creative leader. And so I knew that not only was I making a decision to walk away from this role to be with my family and to repair my health, but I was also 
making a decision that I was going to be working the rest of my professional life as an independent. And that wow. was scary as shit. Yeah. Was, I mean, like, you know, your, your resume includes, you know, Procter and Graham, Gamble and, and Kraft Foods and um, PetSmart and, and huge, huge companies. And so at that point, because that's not that old, it's, let's, let's all remember that, you know, your mid, uh, mid-ish 50s is not that old to say like, hey, I've spent the last, uh, what, 20 years working towards the thing I wanted, the career I thought I wanted, all of this time, all of this effort. You put all of that stuff in and you know in your heart that by walking away, which may be the right thing to do, but mm -hmm. walking away is, is the closing of your corporate career and that's it. How, how did <laughs> how did you do that? Uh, what do you mean? How I, I did it with incredible trepidation. Mm -hmm. I I really had no idea what the future was going to hold because, as I said, I'd really kind of destroyed my me mental health and physical health, and I just know knew that I just couldn't continue. Yeah, but so, what does this look like? Is this like a uh, you know, <laughs> I, I had to figure out scene. It's 11 PM. Yeah, yeah. There's a bottle of scotch. You have the email drafted and you, yeah. you hit send. I'm resigning. You close the laptop and right. you go, I guess that's it. Yeah. Kind of. That was kind of like what it was. And then I took a year off. I literally took a full year off. I did a bunch of, I saw my dad through the last few months of his life. And Is that I, beautiful? like, like, like as scary as everything was, did that at least reassure you like, this is the right, I am doing the right thing because I have Absolutely. this time, I have this freedom. Absolutely. Yeah. I would never, I wouldn't change the last, the last bit of my relationship with him for anything in the world because I feel completely fulfilled about it. I mean, a lot of people in their lives end up with regrets around, you know, family relationships. I have no regrets. Um, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. And a lot of people can't say that. Um, and so, yeah, so I took a year off and I, and I wasn't really sure I liked doing what I was doing anymore. I had kind of destroyed myself so much in terms of my career mentally in my own head that I wasn't really sure that I really enjoyed doing what I was doing anymore. So I had to get away from it for a while. And I ended up, um, I didn't know if I liked design, didn't know if I liked branding, you know, and I just thought, what, what should I do? So I just thought, I started to just look around and I was really excited and inspired by craft, this kind of craft development that was happening in the world. Like there were all these craft makers, leather makers, you know, food, specialty food makers, all this wonderful kind of like get your hands dirty entrepreneurship. Like an artisan type. Yeah. Thing. Movement in the country. And I was fascinated by that. And I was talking to an old strategy partner of mine from a previous agency I worked at and we decided and we, we were both excited about it. So we decided to start a kind of provenance driven craft accessories company, e-commerce company. And so we partnered up together and over a period of a year, we built an e-commerce company that specialized in craft products, bags, candles, you know, honey, you know, food items. Um, and but everything, the criteria was that everything had to be made by a person with a story and we would tell that story. And, but in the process of starting this company and we were bootstrapping everything, right? So it was just her and me. And, you know, I was designing the logo, I was designing the website. I was, you know, building an email list and doing email blasts. I was doing all the product photography. We were going to trade shows and sourcing products and we were setting up all the infrastructure of shipping things. And we were building a company and a brand from absolute scratch. And I was doing everything very hands-on myself. And I hadn't been this hands-on in 20 years. I've been managing teams, you know, as an executive for a long period of time. I hadn't been doing design. I hadn't been doing photography. I'd been directing it. Right. I didn't know Dookie about email marketing. I didn't know anything about content marketing or social media marketing. And so I was having to do all of this for this little startup that we were starting. And what that did for me was it relit the fire in me of the joy of building a brand from scratch. And when we came out of the other end of building that brand, the funny thing was, is that my friend and I were, my colleague and I were driving 
you know, back from a, a, from a, a product buying trip. And she was saying, you know what? It's been really awesome. I'm synopsizing. It's been really awesome building this brand, but I'm not really sure I want to ship products every day. So I'm, I'm going to hand it off to you. And I said, you know what? I don't either. Let's just shutter it. <laughs> so we built this whole thing. We ran it for like three months and we shuttered it. And you could look at that and say, this was an absolute massive fail, right? You tapped your savings to build this thing and to live for a year as you created this thing. But what that was for me was it was an exercise in rejuvenation of my passion for what I did. And then I took that and I said, hey, I'm going to start my own consultancy and I'm going to help small to medium sized businesses and entrepreneurs build their brands from scratch. And I'm going to use the methodology and the techniques that I used with the P and G's and the PepsiCo's and the, and the, you know, the GE's and the Honda's. And I'm going to help little businesses use those to rock and roll. And that's what I do now. And it's absolutely exciting. And I love it more than anything. Um, and, but I needed that year of downtime and I needed that year of creating something from scratch and learning everything from, from, you know, the ground up again to come to that realization and to relight that fire in myself. Um, so it was a, that was a serious lateral move on the, a couple of lateral moves on the, on the web. But then when I started going vertical again, it was gangbusters. Oh, that reassures <laughs> that reassures me so much too because I I am you know of I was gonna say of the generation I don't want to I don't want to be ageist here or anything I, I'm millennial and we were kind of told and promised and, and you know by by everyone that if you just do the right things it'll all work out right you know like like get good grades go to school get a job work your way up the ladder and when you have a setback when you when when things don't go the way that they're supposed to plug in step by step in that linear path. We've all seen the Instagram thing. You know, we think life is like, it goes from A to B, but in fact, it's all squiggly all over the place. Yeah, I'm only realizing now at 39 that every single thing that I've ever done still serves me today. Because yes. I can build on it. I can draw on it. Hey, that, that project 10 years ago, that feels so out of date and so of a different world. Like there were lessons learned there that still serve me. The, the person, the friend that I haven't talked to in five years that I call back up and we fall back into friendship and suddenly now there's like this energy and this spark and we're collaborating on something. Again. Like, hey, that wasn't wasted time. I feel like I'm of the type or the, or the generation to say like everything needs to be contributing to the next thing and it all needs to stack. And so to hear that, that you, can, <laughs> you can try this thing and then not do it anymore and just come to terms with like, I'm, you know what? That served me really well. Thank you. Like I did it. I didn't fail. I decided to move on and it still served me. That reduces the burden that I place on everything that I'm planning as my next steps because I can just try something and if it doesn't work out, it'll still serve me. Like I feel free now. Thank you. Yeah, it's true. And there's this other video that I did. I just want to mention it was called, are you a multi-creative? One of the other things that I've noticed with creative professionals is that they torture themselves over having too many creative pursuits. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and they, and, and it's self-flagellation. And I went through some serious, serious bouts of this, making the decision of you know, putting down my oil paints and starting to do t-shirt design and learning the Macintosh when it first came out, et cetera. And when you said not serving you, that is, that is the footnote of that video, which is that you can, if you find too many pursuits or you're being pulled in too many directions, you just need to look at what you're doing and ask yourself, is this particular pursuit serving me right now? Is it leading? Is it teaching me something I need to learn? Is it inspiring me to keep going? Is it um, leading me in a direction or a path that's a path I want to take? And if it's not serving you, you can put it down. But you don't have to say to yourself, I'm never going to do this again. You don't have to be you know, super final about it. You can just say, this is not serving me right now. So I'm just going to put it down and I'm going to concentrate on this other creative pursuit 
for right now because that one's serving me. You don't have to say it's gone. You don't have to like sell all your stuff. Just put it in storage and say, hey, when this serves me again, I can pick it back up. And that's what I did when I was putting down my oil paints and going into the fashion industry. I said, oil painting is doing nothing but torturing me right now. I loved it. It was fantastic while I was doing it. But all it's doing is call, causing me mental anguish right now. And I need to put this down because it's not serving me in finding a career where I can make a living. And when I'm ready, I can pick that back up. And the funny thing is, is that I, in the last five years, I picked it back up. I said, hey, I feel like oil painting again. And it's going to inspire me and it's going to be fun. And I'm going to approach it in a different way with a different perspective than I did when I was, you know, 20 something. And it is, and it's inspiring me. And it's like giving me balance in my life and giving me a creative outlet that I'm really embracing and enjoying, but making that decision of putting it down for that period of time, even though it was a 20 year period of time, um, was incredibly psychologically painful to do. And so if there's anything in my life that I try to do now, it's give creative professionals the agency to not go through the pain that I went through in my life around a lot of the decisions or the things that happened to me in my career. I just try and share the experience, strength, and hope that I can around living the life of a creative professional with that community. Ah, Philip, you know, uh, Imagine Dragons has a song and the one line is easy come, easy go. And I just sometimes last night, even I was repeating in my head, right? Just trying to hold on to like easy come, easy go. Like we can let go of things. It could come back. Um, I, I have loved, I, I, we could talk for hours, like hours and hours and hours Absolutely. and hours. And I could just deconstruct all of your experiences and everything. Um, unfortunately, you're a very busy man and we're going to have to let you go. But I do have one final question for you. And it's the question I love to cap each conversation with because I think it hits to the heart of, of everyone. For you, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? It all comes down to learning. It all comes down to learning because we learn from the moment we pop out of the womb and we have to learn new things to do new things throughout our entire lives. And life is always throwing you new stuff. So you got to learn something new, whether that's a new communication tool or a new physical tool or a new skill, new way of relating. Um, and as long as you leave yourself open to the fact that you don't know everything, then you're going to be fine. <laughs>